dear brothers and sisters and dear friends, I'm happy to be with you this morning, and I thank God for the privilege that he has given me to visit you once again, and I bring to you many greetings from uh, our people in the Sacramento area. And now, I invite you to open your Bibles with me, and we will turn to Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. Jonah rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. What? Trying to run away from God? What a preposterous idea. <laughs> That's impossible. Yet, from the beginning of the world until today, Men have sought ways to run away from God or to hide from God. Why? Why do men try to hide from God? Tell me why. There's only one reason. Sin is the reason. Disobedience. And there are different ways in which men have tried and uh, are still trying to run away from God. And we will consider some of these different ways. But let us bear in mind the main reason, which is what? Sin, disobedience. Now back to Jonah. In the case of Jonah, the idea of fleeing from the presence of God was derived from uh, the thought that the God of the Hebrews was a local God, a territorial God, like the gods of uh, the heathen nations round about Israel. They had local gods, and uh, it was thought even by many of the Jews, that the God of Israel was a local God. So it was believed that if a person could flee from the territory under the jurisdiction of God, he was beyond his reach. He was no longer accountable to him. Well, this was the thinking of Jonah. Now, what was the problem with Jonah? Why did he want to flee from God? He had received a commission which he was not prepared to carry out. He was commanded to uh, go to Nineveh, that wicked city, and bring a message to the people. What message? Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown and he lacked the needed courage because to give such a message to a city like Nineveh you need courage Noah had the needed courage to preach a message for 120 years but Jonah was a coward up to a certain point, a weakling. He didn't have the needed courage. And uh, I think that he even questioned the wisdom of God in sending him to Nineveh with such a message. He thought, well, what will people say? What will they think of me? They will think that I'm crazy. Nineveh will be overthrown. We have never heard of such a thing. Nineveh will be overthrown. 
Um, uh, Syria was a powerful nation. Yes, in those days, the most powerful nation, like the United States and the world today. So was Assyria in those days. Many of it will be overthrown. How can that be? They will think I'm crazy. And they will send me home. Jonah, go home before something else happens to you, before people stone you to death. So he was afraid and what did he do? He tried to flee from the presence of God. How? He went down to Joppa and took a ship which was going to Tarshish, which was beyond the, the territory um, occupied by the Jews. And then he thought he would be free from God. God would not follow him up to Tarshish. But something happened. Something happened to him. You see, uh, although he was disobedient to God, he had not <coughs> surrendered his heart to the devil. Oh, no. There's a difference between the two things. Many people, including ourselves, sometimes we, we are disobedient to God. But that does not mean that we have surrendered our hearts to the devil. Oh, no, not yet. To surrender one's heart to the devil is something else. We will consider a few examples uh, in this sense also. And God still talked to him and gave him another chance. But God talked to him in, in a painful way giving him a painful experience. God didn't talk to him in words, but in actions. God gave him a painful experience in connection with the second chance. His boat was caught by a terrible storm, but he had already told uh, the, uh, the crew and uh, the passengers why he was fleeing from God. So he, they already knew all about him. And when uh, that uh, terrible storm came, they put the two things together and saw a cause-effect relationship. And they thought, aha, Nona, Jonah is guilty. And they cast lots. <coughs> and got the confirmation. As a matter of fact, Jonah was guilty. Now what shall we do to you? Uh, he said, just throw me overboard. What now? We don't want to do that. <coughs> uh, but there is no other way. Finally, they asked God to forgive them. <laughs> and they threw Jonah overboard. But what happened? What happened? God, God still wanted to speak to him. So God sent a fish, maybe a whale. Well, a whale <coughs> is not a fish, according to modern classification, because a whale is a mammal. But that, that was written before the modern classification of animals and plants came into existence. Amen. So today, conventionally, it is thought that the whale is not a fish. In those days, conventionally, it was thought that the whale was a fish. It could be a whale, or it could be <coughs> another sea monster, or a big fish, who knows? I'm, I'm not going into details in this direction. I, I'm talking about Jonah and his... Uh, and his idea that he could flee from God. And what happened? He prayed in the belly of the fish or of the whale. He prayed to the Lord. 
And when a person under these circumstances prays to the Lord, he confesses his sins. And he says, Lord, and I'm prepared to ch change my mind. As I was, uh, I was trying to, to uh, disobey, now, now I'm prepared to obey. Send me again, give me another chance. And God gave him another chance, and the, the fish or the whale spewed him out on the shore. And now the Lord said to him, now you go to? To Nineveh and give them the message, which he did. Um, another man. Let us remember the case of Adam. What did Adam do? after he had disobeyed. When, when the Lord called him, Adam, where are you? What did he say? Genesis 3, 9, and 10. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, Oh, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Uh, again, I put the question to you, why does man try to hide from God? The reason is the same. I was naked. How does, a, how does a human being become naked before God? In this case, it was, it was literal nakedness, but there is spiritual nakedness. There is spiritual nakedness. And how does a person become naked before God, spiritually naked? Mm -hmm. If he is destitute of the justice of Christ, of the garments of the justice of Christ, or righteousness of Christ, he is naked before God. And let me talk about myself. Before my conversion, I was naked before God. And so were many of you, right? maybe all of us, before our conversion. And uh, when a person is naked, spiritually naked, what is his tendency? Yeah, well, yes, to cover himself with fig leaf aprons, uh, which uh, a fig leaf apron stands for self-righteousness, self-justification, which does not stand before God, right? There's only one type of garment that will stand, that, that will be acceptable before God. What's that? The garment of Christ's righteousness, which we can obtain through imputation and impartation. But, uh, but self-righteousness, Self-justification is nothing but a fig leaf apron. This is good for nothing. So then uh, Adam tried to hide himself from God because he was guilty before God. He had disobeyed God. Now another case, uh, Cain. Let's think about Cain. Genesis 4.16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> he also thought about God as, as uh, uh, having jurisdiction over a certain territory only. <laughs> and if he could get away from that area, then he would uh, escape from the presence of God. I think that that was his... His, his 
way of thinking, his conclusion. But there was a difference between Adam and, uh, and uh, Cain. What was the difference? Both tried to hide or get away from the presence of God. Yes, but there was a difference, a fundamental difference between the two. Uh, what was this difference? When God called Adam answered. Yes. Big pardon? Adam had never sinned. Adam had never? <coughs> I, I, I couldn't, I could not get you. He had, he had never been in sin before, right? He had never been? What? In sin. sin before. In sin. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, no, Adam had disobeyed. Yeah, he, Adam had disobeyed God. But just a minute. Adam had disobeyed God. But uh, Adam still loved the presence of the Lord. Adam had not surrendered his heart to the devil. See? And uh, this is the condition of many of us or of all of us. Sometimes we disobey God, but we do not surrender our hearts to the devil. We still love the presence of the Lord, still want to be reconciled with him and be at peace with him, and we want to do his will, right? So that was the condition of Adam. He still wanted to be with the Lord. Oh, yes. But that was not the condition of, of Cain. Cain had given his heart to the devil. There's no repentance with Cain. He was in rebellion against God, in open defiance against God. Even in, 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 the, in the offerings and the sacrifices, that God re required of, um, of the, the first few human inhabitants of this world, uh, Cain was in open rebellion against God. Because God had required a, uh, the sacrifice of an animal, a blood sacrifice, which has one meaning. And Cain said, no, I will not bring a blood sacrifice. I will bring the, uh, the fruit of my labor. If God accepts it, accepts it, okay. If he doesn't, that makes no difference to me. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was the attitude of Cain. So he surrendered his heart to the devil. That was the difference between the two. And let's bear this difference in mind. Because today there are also two categories of people. Those who disobey God, but they still love God. They still want to be saved. And those who have surrendered their hearts to the devil and don't care about God or about salvation. They know that they are on the way to hell. Now, let us consider a, uh, a second way of, of uh, running away from God. We may smile at the idea of uh, fleeing from the presence of uh, an omnipresent God. <laughs> an omnipresent God, that means a God who is present everywhere we may smile at such an idea. But people today are still trying to flee from an omnipresent God, but in a different way. We are talking about a different way now. For example, how about those who try to deny the, the existence of God, the so-called atheists? This is also a way 
of fleeing from God. Let's read a statement from Psalm 139. A few verses from Psalm 139, 7 to 11. Where shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, or follow me, or punish me. And uh, thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Jeremiah 23, verse 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I, I the Lord, shall not see him? Hmm? Is there such a possibility? Can I, I repeat, can I, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? So the idea of fleeing from the presence of God is a very preposterous idea. It's impossible. But in a sense, uh, many people today are still doing what they did in the past. There are those who think that they... Uh, can run away from God by denying his existence, the atheists, as I have mentioned. What does the Bible say? The fool has said, there is no God, Psalm 14, 1. But by denying the existence of God, no one can put him out of existence. Amen. Is that clear? to all of us, if God exists, no one can put him out of existence by professing to be an, an atheist. No. But there's something else. If God exists, and we have no doubt that he does exist, uh, then he is not hidden beyond the possibility of being found by every honest searcher. Shall I repeat the idea? Since God exists, he is not hidden beyond the possibility of being found by every honest searcher. Therefore, atheists have no excuse whatsoever because God challenges them. How? How does God challenge atheists? And uh, this, this is why they have no excuse. Jeremiah 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. You ask an atheist, have you searched for God with all your heart? No. Then, then you have no argument. You have no argument whatsoever. You have not searched for him. If I say there is no gold in California, someone asks me, well, have you gone out to uh, search for gold? No. Then how can you say there is no gold in California if you have never gone out to search for gold? <laughs> uh, 
But you know that even atheists are haunted with doubts about their own belief or disbelief. Yeah. Because once in a while, the thought flashes through their mind, God may exist. Amen. And if he does exist, how will I be able to stand in his presence on the judgment day? Every atheist is, is haunted by, uh, with, uh, with uh, such um, fears. An atheist, as a general rule, is afraid to die without God. As far as I have read and observed, an atheist is a man who is afraid to die without God. Why? Because he is not sure. He has never been sure. He has been haunt haunted with doubts. Sometimes the thought has, has hit him hard. God may exist, I'm afraid. <coughs> Voltaire, that famous French uh, atheist. Some people say he was not an atheist, he was a skeptic. You know the difference? A skeptic says that Yes, there is a God, but we know nothing about him. We have no possibility to know anything about him. Yes, but he, he does exist, but we know nothing. Well, um, Voltaire was haunted with uh, such doubts, with such doubts that God might exist. But he did not accept uh, what is written in the Bible, oh no. But he was haunted with doubts. And one day he uh, opened the door, walked as far as the gate, and outside, on the outside, there was a boy standing close to the gate, uh, reading a book, a religious book. It was probably a catechism. And uh, Voltaire said to the boy, boy, can you show me with your little finger where God is? Can you point with your little finger to the exact place where God is to be found? The boy looked up to him and said, sir, and can you point to a place where God is not? And Voltaire turned around, defeated, walked back into his house. So let us be sure that those who call themselves atheists are not atheists all the time. <laughs> Sometimes they are atheists, sometimes they are not. And they, as a rule, they are afraid to die, to die without God. Now, another category of people who try to run away from God, or another way of, of trying to run away from God. Some people try to uh, flee from God not by denying his existence, but by living as if he did not exist. The Bible calls this suicidal attitude forgetting God. Psalm 50, verse 22. And you know that David King David um, almost fell into the trap of Satan by accepting such a philosophy. 
Let's read about his experience. He tells, he tells us his experience, Psalm 73. Verses 2 to 13. He says, as uh, for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had dwelt, had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death but their strength is firm. Uh, they are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Uh, therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. Uh, yes, they have more than heart could wish of the things of this world. Uh, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression, and they speak loftily. Uh, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and the waters of, uh, of a full cup are wrung out of them to them. And they say, how does God know? How does God know? Does God uh, take knowledge of every little detail? Of every little thing? No, God is too busy uh, to watch over every one of us to see what uh, each one of us is doing. How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? That means, is there knowledge uh, of every little detail? What did Jesus say? God knows what? Even? How many hairs each one of us has on his head? <laughs> but anyhow, People live as if God did not exist. And uh, then he says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They prosper in, in secular ways. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. And verse 2 again, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. But before he could, he could go too far in the wrong direction, he came to himself God spoke to him. The Holy Spirit spoke to him and held him back. And he came to himself. And he dismissed, discarded his foolish thoughts. Yet, many people, many professed Christians today, even today, consent to become pathetic victims of this deception. And Satan is trying to put into our hearts also the thought that it's not convenient for us to, uh, to be too conscientious about, about walking with the Lord while we can enjoy the good things of this life. Isn't Satan trying to put such ideas into our hearts? Now, Jesus warned us against accepting such concepts. Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 30. 
6. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that they come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy uh, to escape all these things that shall come upon, that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. <coughs> Um, let's also read in Malachi chapter 3. Let's read about those people who do not deny the existence of God. They just decide to live as if God did not exist. That's it. When they say, oh, God understands the, these problems. He will overlook these uh, these things because he understands uh, my difficulties my problems I'm doing my best anyhow and God understands that so don't worry everything will be okay my fate will not be worse than the fate of, of millions and millions of other Christians who are doing worse than I am than I'm doing I'm not worse than you are and you are not better than I am. So, if God has to destroy me, then he will have to destroy practically the whole world. And if the Christian world and so forth is to be saved, I will also be saved. In other words, if I'm lost, then many people will be lost. Many millions or billions of people will be lost. If I'm saved, then many millions or billions of people will be saved. And they live as if God did not exist. That's it. And they think they're doing their best. So Malachi also wrote about these people, uh, and he wrote about these last days, as we can read in, the, in continuation. Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Your words have been stout against me, says the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said it's, in, it's vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered, and we have to suffer. Huh? And we have nothing, and they have everything. But, in continuation, hmm, what do we read in continuation? Well, the day will come when you will see the difference between uh, those that serve the Lord and those that do not serve the Lord. Verse 16 and 17. You will see the difference. Verse 18. Yeah. The day will come when you will see the difference, but then it will be too late for you to change. Or for anyone to change. Verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Mm -hmm. Then it will be too, cha too late to change. Better make up your minds today. As I mentioned before, uh, 
God speaks to us sometimes in painful ways in order to give us a second chance to wake us up. And I've been thinking of uh, Solomon, for example. Solomon went the wrong way. I've been thinking of, uh, of uh, Samson also. Samson, he went the wrong way. And what happened? How did the Lord speak to him in a painful way? Giving him a second chance. He did not deny the existence of God. He only lived as if God did not exist. And uh, what, what was his main problem? The misuse of his eyes. He could not see what? what? What is it that he could not see without feeling seriously tempted? And God knew how to take care of that problem and what happened. God permitted his enemies to gouge out his eyes, make him blind, and he was not able to misuse his eyes anymore. And, uh, and uh, Samson became a slave in the hands of the Philistines. And there he had a chance to repent and turn to God again. And God accepted his repentance and he confessed his sins. And he is mentioned among the heroes of the faith, Hebrews 11. So I say again, unfortunately, many of us have a tendency to walk along the precipice as close to the, uh, to the edge as possible and see how we can get away with it. Unfortunately, many of us have such a tendency. And the Lord speaks to many of us in a painful way. But if it works, we have to accept it. Better, it's, what did Jesus say? It's better for us to, to get into the kingdom of heaven with one eye, or even blind, if need be, then to keep our both, keep our both eyes and go to hell. To hell, that means to the destruction, to be burnt. So it's a dangerous thing, a very dangerous thing to leave hold of the arm of, of the Lord and fall into the hands of the devil. It's a very, very dangerous thing. Brothers and sisters, let's realize that we are engaged in a battle between life and death. And we either resist God and go along with Satan, or we resist Satan and go along with God. There's no middle way. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Therefore, brethren, Hebrews 3, 7, and 8, today if you hear his voice, Harden not your hearts. And Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is here. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord 
and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The door of probation is still open before us. We still have a chance to make sure that we have acceptance before the Lord. Amen. Amen.